Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Stephen Spector. With me today is uh, Rob Hirschfeld from Rack N. Rob, how are you doing today? Hello, Stephen. Good to talk to Good to talk, and I'm very excited. We have a really interesting guest today, and uh, I think it's Yves Bordreau, and I, I think I may have mashed it. Yves, did I do okay? Well, it's, it's close. I answered to a lot of names, but yes, Yves, Yves Boudreau. Uh, well, uh, it's, which I know might, might be a confusing name for some people, but we'll, we'll well, get into that later. Well, I grew up in Ohio, and I think that's part of the problem is uh, my Ohio accent <laughs> doesn't know that there's anything outside of the Midwest. Um, my, 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 I spent 13 years in New Orleans, so New Orleans, actually, and uh, so I've, I've got an advantage on, on this one. It's a lot of, uh, Boudreaux, a lot of Boudreaux in uh, <laughs> In Cajun country, yes, I think I think Rob, I should have let you introduce. So, uh, <laughs> Yves is from Ericsson, and Yves, can you just uh, give us a little bit of background on yourself, and then we'll start talking about a new Ericsson project you're working on. Sure, sure. Um, I've been with Ericsson now for about six years. Uh, I think I just celebrated my anniversary back in September. Um, so, a great company. If you're not familiar, they're kind of based out of Stockholm. They've been around for a long, long time. I think it's like 100. 40 years or so, largely focused on telecommunications, uh, sales to enable service providers to offer different types of service. Usually it's voice, voice, video, and data, and a lot of mobility. Um, and held a couple of jobs here over the years. Uh, first three years, I was a head of technical sales for their media and television uh, product lines. Um, then I did a short stint in the CTO organization, reporting into the mothership in Sweden. Um, and recently, I was asked if I'd be interested in joining the UDN or the Unified Delivery Network Program and uh, to take care of uh, heading up the partnership and ecosystem strategy for that organization. So long list of startups in the past. This is my, my first big company. It's been, been a great six, six year ride here and looking forward to starting this new project. Well, that's fantastic. Well, so let's let's jump in. Tell us a little bit about the um, you know, the Ericsson Unified Delivery Network, and, and then as we go in there, uh, the conversation will go all over the place. Sure, okay. So if you, I think you kind of looked at the website originally, so there's some, of course, uh, much more summary information um, there, but ultimately what you're seeing on that webpage is that we're trying to, uh, in partnership with service providers, build the, word, the world's first web scale edge. So what does that mean? And maybe we can just start real briefly by kind of setting out some, some beliefs that we have that have driven and continue to drive kind of the direction of the program. Um, so from an Ericsson standpoint, um, and we'll just cover three of these to not belabor the points, but you'll at least get some idea of the thinking behind this. Um, Ericsson has largely been focused primarily on the service provider space. You know, there's some 600 service providers out there between cable guys, telcos, mobile operators, satellite folks, anybody delivering TV, internet, phone services are, are primarily uh, our customer base and have been for many, many years. We, we dabble in other areas and, and have focused programs to go get into new verticals, but the lifeblood typically has been the service provider space um, for Ericsson. And so uh, their success is our success. And, and when they struggle, we, we have a tendency of struggling as well. So um, at the moment, uh, you can imagine that globally service providers have been kind of feeling the, the pinch with a lot of OTT uh, services in, in all shapes and forms kind of coming in and, and flooding the networks. And um, ultimately, we believe that uh, all of our operators are quite important in the delivery chain of services to consumers. In fact, without them, there is no internet, which is, uh, which is an interesting point that people kind of seem to forget sometimes. Um, but we believe ultimately that our, these operator customers that we have have some really key assets. Um, you know, they have some data, they have data centers, they have connectivity, they have geography and, and, and a lot of things that alone those service providers do a pretty good job at monetizing, you know, in their countries or states or sometimes in multi-country. But just by nature of uh, the way the service providers have kind of grown over the years um, and, and are heavily regulated, they can only operate in, in certain countries or, or certain parts of the country and are kind of limited. So they can't really be global, um, although you can see some examples of some companies trying to go global in their strategies, and, and they may very well succeed, but the, the large majority of operators are going to operate kind of in a, in, in a smaller kind of geography. So what if Ericsson could figure out a way to take some of these assets, uh, pull them together, 
make some of our own investments uh, and, and create something in partnership with operators that could look global. So that, that's one of the, the first beliefs is what assets do these operator have, operators have that are, uh, you know, alone are, are, are interesting, but together, pooled together, really create something unique from an edge standpoint. Um, the other belief that we have is, and I think we've learned this, and that's not really a belief more than a practice, and you guys have probably seen this as well, and tell me if you haven't, um, is that when, when a content provider, you know, somebody providing an OTT TV service or, or an application provider, somebody who's running in public cloud today, they don't want to go to, uh, you know, three, four, five, six different people to go and get their infrastructure. They typically would rather go to one, maybe two, to try and roll out their applications. They really want global coverage for delivery of their content or for hosting and execution of their applications. So we believe that that's what people want to buy in the market from a cloud standpoint. They don't want to buy regionally, they want to buy globally, or at least understand that they have the ability to buy globally in the future. So, so if, when, yep. when you're saying people here, I want to, so that there's, there's, it, there's a, a huge stack up of technologies in this case, and, yes. and, but also parties, <laughs> because yes. you've got a carrier who's providing a service, you've got a user, Who's, who's trying to consume a, a video stream from Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or HBO or, 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 or. Um, and so can you break that? I mean, it's, it's sort of, you're saying there's a global, sure. there's a global footprint for say a Netflix. Um, we we'll use them as the poster child, although there's mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of competition there uh, today. So they're they're trying to they're trying to get content to a user. The user's somewhere in the in the globe. We're crossing all sorts of commercial boundaries because the 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 the, the providers are geographically distributed. Yeah. Um, but so there, there's this it's a weird mix, right? The the con the content doesn't care about the boundaries. The content doesn't care about the platforms. That's right. Neither That's does right. the user. Um, yeah. Is that a fair recharacterization of what's going on with this? It is a fair re recharacterization. So if okay. I was to give you two examples here, when we talk about content providers, I can give you some examples of folks that we've had uh, numerous discussions and hosted in some of our face-to-face um, -face meetings, for example, who are kind of aware of what we're doing and, and um, are supportive of, of our initiatives. Uh, an example would be Fox as a content provider, right? So when Fox okay. goes and you know pays a global cdn to deliver its content it pays a global cdn to deliver globally um, they're not really all that interested generally speaking the content provider community in going and having you know 10 or 20 different cdn deals uh, if they can prevent it so you know in a perfect environment content providers would love to deal with people that can offer them global coverage um, ironically enough over the years uh, people have kind of broken away from one provider for all and have adopted a, a multi CDN strategy, which is really, really good for them uh, because it gets them better coverage, better performance in countries that they may, thinking, uh, may think about going into. Um, but it's also kind of added a little bit of complexity to how they monitor and, and measure rebuffering events and try and understand the performance of their content. But for, so, for all intents and purposes, they, they, they really are looking for strategies to deploy uh, content in, in more than just one geography. Uh, typically speaking, but, but that that opens up a different question to me. You know, we're talking about edge infrastructure, um, which is which gets my antenna way up on that. And I guess we're excited, um, and so we're we're talking about content content providers who are then using different CDNs. CDNs are deployed in you know, no content no no CDN provider really owns the infrastructure they're they're in, right? They're, they're really just a couple of servers or racks of servers in a geo. Is that a fair assessment of what a CDN would look like? It's a co-load space in some case? Yeah, I would say that uh, I always uh, try not to say that all or none yeah, <laughs> because sure. there's yeah. always one example here and there. So yes, predominantly what you just said is correct. They typically do take up some rack space in a, in a particular facility. Um, and, and they're actually installing their equipment there. There are some scenarios where people are building their own CDNs and do have agreements with ISPs to go put that equipment into those CDNs, but those cases um, are, I wouldn't say are few and far between, but they're not, they're not the norm. What you just described there wow, is, is typically that's, the norm. That's incredibly heterogeneous, right? So we're talking about distributed infrastructure, globally distributed infrastructure, where in some cases the infrastructure is owned by a company and 
they're renting space. In some cases, they're renting servers or access. Do, is there a trend line? Are people moving to like being able to you know just say, oh, I need to rent some machines. I need to rent some uh, some you know VMs on a machine or some 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 processing power. Or do you still have to buy the machines and then park them at a server and manage that infrastructure? Well, yeah, that's a that's a great. Uh, a great observation there. I mean, I, I would say that in the last 20 years, uh, it'd be hard pressed to find somebody who would say they're not, we're not moving uh, significantly faster than we have been uh, in yeah. the past. So you're right. So, you know, I was talking to a startup here in Atlanta uh, yesterday, actually, and, and they're in this dilemma right now um, where they have to figure out ways to move faster and faster. And it is just easier to figure out a way to spin up infrastructure uh, either in, in, in a public cloud or, or in a bare metal as a service type of an offering um, or on the UDN for that matter uh, in order to actually get to market faster and get that scale much, much quicker rather than doing the traditional rent data center space, rack my equipment, order my equipment, rack my equipment, configure my equipment. Um, it, those, those days are, are largely gone for people who want to move quickly. <laughs> I, would, I would say they're, they're gone because nobody, yeah, nobody has the patience. It, it's everybody nope. wants to consume that the infrastructure as a service is the is the is where things are going if they're not there. Yeah. They're through their yeah. public cloud, right? For the yeah. big use. Yeah. Uh, and they those I believe are. those assumptions are going to get baked into people's work. And it sounds like UDN is actually part of you're you're baking this cloud consumption model into an edge delivery service for the service providers. Is that a fair that's that that is that's a fair that's a fair statement. Good. That's a good way of putting it. Ultimately, we're delivering content as a first application, uh, but ultimately the UDN itself is meant to have multiple applications running at the edge of the operator network. Um, so multi-tenant. To... Yeah, I'm, I'm, so yeah. I'm interested, you know, if it's a multi-tenant scenario, then, you know, how are you keeping traffic, seg you know, is that become a cloud? You know, what, how do you think of that if it's truly a multi-tenant, you know, sort of elastic infrastructure at the edge? Yeah, I think that right now uh, the, the tenancy model is we're, we're the ones running our own applications on the network and offering, let's say, in the most simplistic way, that CDN or delivery capacity uh, out to the market. The, the tomorrow kind of view of this is exactly what you just said, which is creating that multi-tenancy approach. And, and we're really focused in my, you know, my days and, and weekends now are kind of filled with trying to figure out a, a more focused approach to... Um, you know, some drivers towards people who want to use the edge of the network uh, to run their applications or to host some of their functions. And, and those are largely driven by, at least our current thinking is, and, and you can certainly influence and change that thinking for me as we kind of learn uh, as we go here as well. But we're looking for uh, applications that are very latency sensitive. We're looking for applications that have desperate need for very high performance in terms of throughput, for example. Uh, we're looking for applications that have data security or data sovereignty issues where you have to be in a physical uh, zip code or a physical country or physical city limit. Um, and, and frankly, we're looking for people who pay public cloud bills today that say, you know what, I just can't run this on Amazon or Azure. Um, for some strange reason, if I actually could have a low latency edge with these kind of data security or data sovereignty considerations, uh, we'd much, much rather execute a subset of our cloud strategy at the edge of a network. So we're actively looking, right. you know, who, who are those tenants gonna be? Uh, and frankly, is the stack that we've built so far uh, and deployed, is that gonna be appropriate for hosting those particular applications, functions, processes, uh, however they've packaged their software. So we're getting kind of, you know, hits across the board here of people who want, you know, Lambda type functions all the way from people who just want bare metal. So, yeah, I, mean, you, you're, I think your list of, of use cases is sort of the textbook edge use case. Um, the, the, one of the things that has me intrigued, though, is how people expect this delivered, right? So are they, are yep. they showing up with, uh, you know, sort of a, well, I did this on Amazon. You said Lambda is a great example. You know, I, yep. I, I wrote a function. It works in Lambda. I want to run it in, in on the edge here, right? And and did they expect a Lambda service, right? I mean, I guess you know, my, Amazon's trying to do that with Green Greengrass. Uh, yes. you know, Microsoft looks like they're trying to do that with some of their Azure Cloud pieces, Azure Stack stuff. 
you know, are you are you seeing customers coming in and saying, yeah, it works it works at Amazon. That's what I want to do here. That's what I want to make work at the edge. Is that your? Uh, that's, that's, yeah. Right? I actually, I actually haven't seen that just yet, but I think that's just because I haven't spoken to, um, to enough people um, and I haven't challenged them enough to think a little bit outside of the box. Um, you know, we get feedback from some people who are quite happy with the public cloud providers that they pay today. And frankly, the applications that they run really are not 27, 24 by seven operations, have no real real time characteristics. Hmm. And, you know, they've kind of really embedded themselves in the, you know, frankly, the great tools and the, the toolkits that have been provided by most, I would say, uh, of, of the, the public cloud providers. I mean, we run some of our applications in the public cloud as well for some of our uh, our product offerings. Where, where we've run into a lot of feedback from the application guys, and these are the people that are buying public cloud services to build their services and launch their, their commercial offerings, is that I don't know that they, or the feedback to, to us kind of, you know, behind closed doors has been, you know, we didn't realize that we've really kind of written ourselves into Amazon 100%. Even if we wanted to leave, <laughs> right. even, if, even if we wanted to leave, we, we couldn't leave. And frankly, in some cases, they're just as happy staying at Amazon and everything is working fine. In other cases, they're doing everything they possibly can to engineer themselves out of Amazon or out of Azure. Um, right. I, but, I think um, there's, there's no doubt that Amazon is the expectation, right? You're, you, for... Ericsson or anybody else to come up with a, an alternate Lambda. Um, and, and people are doing this, right? And there's, there are some alternates out there. Um, so maybe Lambda is not the best example, but if somebody's writing serverless, they're gonna write it on Lambda first, and then they need that behavior to be portable. Um, you know, but, but saying, oh, I have a better Lambda is silly. Amazon's already set the bar, right? Yes, the best, the the is best thing you can do to make edge work is going to be to create very compatible infrastructure choices. Um, so I, have a, I, I was just gonna add a question to that. So does that mean almost you would like to have like, I wanna say a mini Amazon within your own data center that runs Amazon platform? Mm. Not you on should Amazon. Say a mini, if you a mini Azure might be more appropriate since that's exactly well, what Azure. That's what they're doing with Azure Stack. Yeah, that's right. But but does that make sense? Yeah, we, Do your does that make sense for customers to use? No, and that's not what we're doing at the moment. In fact, I, I think that what we're what we're currently kind of focused on and what our at least what my belief is personally is that creating a full stack at the edge of the network is not not only not what we should be doing, but not what people actually are looking for. Um, ironically enough, you just mentioned two perfect examples where uh, Amazon seems to think a, a very small subset of that is a good idea, whereas Microsoft seems to feel that Azure Stack and the, the full stack at the edge is where, where they want to go for their customer base. And they're probably correct. You know, both of these companies, uh, you know, we, we've taken um, some some good feedback from them as well over the years. And um, I think they're doing what's right for their current customer base. And frankly, a lot of the decisions that they make, much like ours, are, are customer driven. And what we're getting back from customers is, is not that they want a, a, a replacement versus an augmentation. And they want us to bring, you know, some value propositions and, and the environment and share with them our thoughts of what we think, uh, you know, should be happening at the edge of the network. And frankly, what applications should live there? And we've got two vested parties in this case, right? We've got the, the application providers themselves and we have the service providers. The right. service providers are very motivated to actually figure out ways to use other assets in the network or the network itself and the transmission equipment in a creative way to add additional value. So right. I, I don't think I've had these lengthy of conversations where everybody has come to the table proactively to try and figure out a way to make this work because I think there's one belief that they all have, which is there's not gonna be less public cloud, there's gonna be more public cloud going forward as IT starts to roll out from, you know, uh, the traditional hosted environment all the way out to how much edge capacity can I get and how fast can you give it to me? I, I strongly agree with that statement. I, the, the edge eats the cloud or edge kills the cloud comments I think are completely naive. The, the yeah. simple reality is the more edge we do, the more cloud we're going to do. And it's, it, to me, it's very synergistic, right? I'm teaching people how to consume automated infrastructure in the cloud. The extent to which they get that experience at the edge that, and I don't mean that they replicate the full stack, that, that I can show up with an automated process and a CI CD pipeline and, you know, server, you know, the, those, those, that thinking, the extent to which you, you're able to replicate it at the edge, you create a, a, 
uh, win-win synergy. I hate to, you know, just throwing it way over the top, but it, you cre right, you create this virtuous cycle um, where we've made things easier to consume at the edge. That creates more demand for the cloud. It creates more demand for the edge. Um, I don't think we're there yet at all. Um, but I do think I, I don't answer. I, I don't. Uh, I don't disagree with you at all. Uh, in fact, so, uh, the way I would tell people normally is is quite simple. Even Amazon started with you know S3 and EC2 as as cornerstones of the operation. They didn't build Rome in a day. And uh, over time, I think you'll see the edge progress in that same kind of a fashion. And my hope is that it's largely driven by new applications or by ones that that significantly get advantage from being executed at the edge of a service provider network. That's my hope. So do you think something like containers and you know Kubernetes or some type of container scheduler that creates an abstraction becomes the delivery you know abstraction that could be the edges EC2 if you will where people say well it runs in Kubernetes if you can host Kubernetes in a multi-tenant way for me everything else is good it's where, where does that rank for you? You know, I, I've been trying to actually figure out a way now to, and I've got to document this, you know, to kind of explain to people. So I'll, I'll give it a shot here uh, off the cuff and you guys tell me how crazy I am. You're but crazy. When I look at... Oh, sorry. I have to listen well, first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, <go ahead. laughs> um, you know, I, I'm trying to put uh, things into hopefully simple perspectives for people who don't necessarily understand the market. And frankly, I'm still learning a lot about um, you know, what's going to be valuable at the edge and what's not. But if I was to put, you know, customers, right, people who would consume these edge resources into kind of three major buckets. The first bucket, I would say, is people who have public cloud, who run everything in public cloud, who now feel like they are being held hostage by their public cloud provider, which is their feeling, maybe not the reality. The second bucket is uh, people who um, day one, designed their software stacks to be completely portable in some way, shape, or another, whether it's in VMs or containers or what have you. Uh, and then there's a third set of people who haven't quite figured out how they're going to move uh, to the cloud and are just kind of in early making decision phases. So people who don't necessarily use any public cloud today. And the reason why I put them in those three stacks is, is that you would build something completely different for all three of them, in my opinion. Um, Ironically enough, if we were to focus solely on container as a service, for example, I think that's great for people who have um, you know, containerized applications who are ready to be portable. What I'm finding out in discussions with people is that you know, what we talk about at conferences versus the, the monoliths uh, that we have in, in reality and production are, are not portable. So there's work to be done there. And I think this is where Mark, uh, Mark and the AppSera guys um, uh, are really adding a lot of value to their customer base, trying to, uh, with the, the AppSera platform itself, helping them actually make those migrations and get them into uh, a platform which helps them uh, make these workloads and, and applications portable uh, from system to system, you know, with the right level of governance and security and, and management of the actual overall code um, in a multi-tenant environment. Um, but the assumption is that everybody runs stuff in containers today. Everything's 100% portable. There's no dependencies on Azure Tables or DynamoDB or any of the other tertiary services of these public clouds, and that's just not the reality. So we're now trying to sort out, okay, of these three different customer bases, right, which ones are going to be the first to kind of adopt Edge Cloud? Um, and based on the feedback that we get from them, what is it that we have to build for you? Are we going to build bare metal? Are we going to build container as a service? Are we going to build just function execution? Um, so we're still in that kind of forming and norming stage right now to make sure that what we're building is going to be usable by the people who will be first to market to, to consume those resources. It's a really interesting point. And, and I think my big takeaway you know, from, from what we've been building with Racken and the, the customers we talk to in data centers is that there is no homogeneous answer, even in people's own infrastructure. Heterogeneity, different choices, you know, a workload might need specialized hardware, it might need a VM isolation. Yeah, it, so yeah, the, the idea that people are just gonna show up with one thing, um, even, even if the world was all containerized, um, we talk to people who have very different container needs um, from that infrastructure, and so heterogeneity is the reality, um, I think it's the edge reality. Um, yep. 
you know, that's the, the, the people don't realize how much Amazon benefits from basically saying, if you don't fit, you don't come. Mm -hmm. And, and so all of enterprise, you know, enterprise IT in some ways they're draining the cream off the, the IT infrastructure and, and, and the stuff that's being left in the IT data centers is really the things that are not easy to move. Um, and I think Amazon realizes that. And then when I look at market, the edge is the next place where we're moving into it. Um, but I, I do think one of the, the, the benefits you've got is that most of the edge pieces are greenfield work. I, 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 you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, are people trying to port, you know, an enterprise application into an edge data center to try and reduce, reduce latency, or is this mostly net new? I think what, uh, so depending on which enterprise we're talking about, if we're talking about traditional enterprises and, you know, it's, um, you know, par partially what Microsoft has been focusing on um, because that's their customer bases. They still very much are, you know, the progressive ones are, are heavily invested in virtual machines. Um, and yeah. uh, I remember for years and years, you know, in the public and private arenas of Amazon saying that they, they, they could never or would never for some reason support virtual machines and, you know, comes invent last year and big announcements of the partnership with VMware, which I think is great for customers who want to use virtual machines and make those things portable. And I think it's great for companies like Amazon who prove, you know, again, that they are willing to listen to customers in terms of what they need to make their applications run, make them portable and what have you. Um, but it really depends on, on the industry, right? So if I look in telecom, for example, most long-term telecom applications uh, and this is not for all providers, but at least for, I would say, the majority of the ones I've worked for in the past and from my experience, uh, at best, something is virtualized. To, to, to say I'm going to take a, a telecom application, yeah. pick anyone you want, and say I'm going to go run that in a container, um, it's not like it's a full redesign of the application, but it's, it's, you know, we're not just talking about containers. We're talking about an entire different methodology, thought process, religion of engineering and deploying software. You know, we are talking about CI, CD, yeah. and DevOps. And, People I, in telecom, they've written some fabulous software over the years, right? Some not so good, but for the majority, <laughs> I've seen a lot of really great, great software, but it's deployed in a different environment. We're not talking about spinning up an instance, right, to do some machine learning that's heavy on GPUs at the edge of the network that within an hour it's done that I bought on the spot market. We're talking about lifeline services, right? If 911 doesn't just get spun up for, for, for the 15-minute duration of a call, it's a 24-7 service that has specific expectations from consumers, government officials, and frankly, the service providers who buy the software, that it's going to be highly available at all times. So, that's, you know, at best, they virtualize that software. They don't put it into containers yet, but they do want to put it into but containers. That's, but that's, I think, but that's a transitionary, right? So we, we built a whole bunch of VMware yeah. clouds with SAN backends that had VMs that were more robust than, than, than individual servers. Kudos, great. We drove the industry off a cliff because we didn't write robust distributable software. We we wrote yes. fragile, you know, bespoke, don't touch me software. When the reality is, if I want to have that type of reliability, I really need to make sure that I can start, stop, suspend, destroy. Right? I my I need to have much faster pace of turn for that you infrastructure. Um, you and got so, it. so yeah, I mean, it totally. I mean, I've I've watched the um, NFV sort of idea, right, like in the, you're, you're doing an FV and we're packaging them in, in VMs because that's, right, the way we think about doing it and it's how we control the IP. But it's really clunky and ugly, right? I've seen people build NFV chains where it's like VM, 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 VM to do a little tiny function. And so your service, your service chaining, a, you know, all this weight for actually tiny functions. Um, and you look at it and you're just like, that doesn't make any sense. And when you look at edge and ah, but you know, that's not edge the point. The point is I told you I could do it. That's not the point. The <laughs> point is I told you I could do it and, and look, I did it. <laughs> oh, I, there's, there's some... it, it's funny that you mentioned that, right? Cause I, I don't even see this as a transition anymore. I see it as a, as a necessary seismic shift. Right. And, and in so. a lot of cases, what's old is, well, I mean, right now we're not talking about people transitioning. They really have to make some wholesale changes here in terms of how they actually engineer and deploy software. And it's hard for some people and it's not necessary for everybody. I would say the, the hope is that everybody will get there, but they're, they're really, this is not really going to be a transition. This is going to uh, be uh, I, in a lot of cases really kind of a, a cut and go somewhere else. It's, it's a cap and grow. It's not a, 
let's migrate. It's not a migration anymore. This is really a, we have to change fundamentally the way that we build and deploy software to take advantage of new technologies that are available today that were not when we designed the software, you know, five, seven, 10 years 30, ago. 40. And Cobalt programs I, are still so, out there. So, so I, I, <laughs> I, I, like I want to I, I I put a very fine point on that because I totally agree with you. I hope people listening um, have stuck with it for, for, the, for the full podcast are thinking, what does that mean, right? How do, what is, we, we are talking about, right, CI, CD pipelines. We're talking about completely automated infrastructure. We're talking about immutable builds. We're talking about ways of, of building applications so that they are designed to be this part, part of this continuous integrated workflows. Um, and it, it is, it's a totally different way to build your software because you have to assume that instances come and go or cap, you know, services come and go, that it's robust and reliable and, and broken into little pieces and incrementally changeable. And if we don't do it, we will have WannaCry, hacks, right? Zero day is gonna get faster and faster, right? Our ability to patch and fix things, you know, the system will get more and more fragile if we don't make these transitional changes. Um, yeah. I completely, I completely agree. I completely so, agree. We're, you know, so we're, there, we're big, a we're lot big of fans stuff. of companies. Yeah, we're big companies of fans like uh, of companies like yours and and uh, and Upsera and Marantis, uh, you know, which we're an investor in. You know, companies mm -hmm. like CoreOS, I think, who are developing that software to make sure that we have some level of automation that helps us scale quickly, and but also making sure that the security pieces are top of mind. Um, I really, really like your service chaining example because it brings up an age old ebb and flow problem that just keeps coming around every few years. Just when you think you're not locked in to a piece of technology. And I think you guys have used the, the technology debt kind of argument many times. So I'll, I'll borrow yeah. it from you guys, but just when you think you, you, you've, you've been independent from your, your vendor or your open source community or the language you've been using, all of a sudden you realize that you're, you're, you're right back into some level of commitment, right? It's not even locking, yeah. you're committed to something. It doesn't matter what it is. And all of a sudden something new comes along and man, I, I really wish I hadn't committed to all that stuff. And so, well, let's go and engineer some architectures uh, that will actually show that we're not, lock, not really locked in just for the, be able you know, we're going to show that we have, we still have freedom. Right. We're, we're going to be okay. And all of a sudden we create these monstrosities of, of chains that have nothing, uh, not a better purpose of proving that you're not locked in and then proving that you could actually do it. So that's great. I'm glad you picked the lock. Good, good for there, you. Now, now we're definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, this, is, this is one of my favorite expressions with this one is the tautology, right? Abstractions are useful until they're not, <laughs> which is sort of, <laughs> right? So it's this idea, it's like, oh, I'm using this great, you know, everything's clean. And then you get to a point, you're like, I can't use the, you know, my abstraction just broke. And either your abstraction becomes so complex and ugly that it's not useful anymore, or you have to have a way to pierce your abstraction to do the work that you need to get done, right? And so anything we design, and this to me is part of what, what we're talking about around with Edge and what you're describing with, everything's shiny and gleaming until you hit that one puddle of mud. Um, you, know, you, you have to account in your designs that sometimes you just have to pierce the veil, do the work you have to do, and then, and then come back up. Um, yeah. Uh, the edge is going to be full of those use cases, right? These, all these GPU, yeah. AI, low latency things where you, you know, suddenly care about what type of RAM is in the system because I need, you know, that fast performance, right? All that it's, you know, you're, you're cruising along happily and then you hit that and you just have to yeah. deal with it at some point. Um, and that to yeah. me drives, uh, I, drives I, the cloud, the, the anti-cloud or the edge use case. I find it super entertaining that people still believe uh, in their heart of hearts that the internet runs on oxygen, right? There's hardware at the bottom of every one of that, those packets that get sent. <laughs> there are and cables you, the, under the ocean. <laughs> there are. Yeah. I've been very impressed with, with the, uh, you know, we've got a very close partnership with Intel and, and several other uh, hardware companies actually. And, and it's, you know, after being beat down for so many years, I, I still, you know, kudos to them for continuing to, to innovate uh, on the hardware side of the platforms mm -hmm. um, to really kind of make some of these, these cloud advancements possible. I don't think that, um, that without that continued I innovation that they've brought to the table after, you know, decades of abuse and commoditization, I don't think we could have done it with those guys. Um, you know, yeah. you can throw out all the names that you want in those cases, you know, in, in, 
I, I agree with you. The hardware still matters, and there's a tremendous amount of innovation uh, going on at, at that layer. It just, by percentage, fewer and fewer, fewer people care, um, or have to, actually, I should say it more carefully, have to care, right? Yeah. Serverless is awesome because if I, and, and you know, we, Racken uses serverless functions as part of our SaaS component, right? It's awesome because we didn't have to manage servers or scale them or do any of that. It's all there. And yet we're a deep hardware company because, you know, it, it matters too. And you can run the full spectrum. It's just fewer people care. And that's, that's what we want. We, you know, what you're doing with Edge is literally telling people, and now we're, and actually this is probably a good place to wrap, wrap everything with a bow. The content providers just want to deliver content. And you're saying, we can abstract this out. We can create a universal platform so that those things all fit together and the people who don't need to pierce the veil of that abstraction don't have to pierce the veil of that abstraction. You got it. Is that fair? Yep, so, so I'll, I'll jump in and um, it was a great conversation and use, I, I wanna just give the website for the Ericsson Unified Delivery Network. It's, uh, it's www.ericssonudn.com and Ericsson has two S's and one C. And, um, and if you are uh, listening to this podcast and you clicked it through from our blog, the, the links will be there as well. And uh, Yves and Rob, thanks again. I think it was a really good conversation. We were, we've been in the weeds and it was good to go a little bit higher level and talk about big customers and, and looking at the edge and how a company like Ericsson is really uh, you know, delivering this service already. It's not something people are talking about for the future. It's here now. And uh, thank you to uh, both of you for joining us and, and use hopefully in about six months or so, maybe we'll come back and check in with you and take a, an updated snapshot of where you are and what you're seeing. Uh, I think it's really good for our listeners to stay in touch with the, what's happening at the massive scale uh, that a company like Ericsson is doing. Definitely. Absolutely. I appreciate it. This was great guys. Thanks, Lisa.